Well, we have a really packed agenda for this webinar, so I'll just get started with some introductions. Um, my name is Garland Mason. I'm the program coordinator for AgriAbility Virginia. Welcome to this webinar today that's co-hosted by the Virginia Association for Biological Farming, the, beginning, the Virginia Beginning Farmer and Rancher Coalition Program, VCE, Virginia Cooperative Extension, and the VSU Small Farms Outreach Program. Um, so this webinar is Injury Prevention for Farmers, and we've got some great speakers that uh, Dr. Kim Nawalny will introduce in just a moment. So before that, I'm just going to go into a couple of technical logistics. Um, so this is a Zoom webinar, so participants are muted and the video is not shown. Um, and if you need tech support, you can contact Katie Trazo in the chat or via the email, via her email for support at ketrazo at vt.edu, and she'll put that in the chat right now. Um, so also I want to note that for this webinar, we'll be doing live captioning um, and you can enable the captions by clicking the CC button and then view full transcript um, at the bottom of your screen. And you can also check out the Verbit link in the chat for customized caption viewing experience. Um, so uh, Katie will set that up in the chat right now. Um, next, we are recording this webinar and it will be available on the, the Virginia Beginning Farmer and Rancher Coalition website, as well as the Virginia Association for Biological Farming website. Um, and we'll announce it via the Virginia Beginning Farmer and Rancher Coalition listserv. And you can sign up for either the Virginia Beginning Farmer and Rancher Coalition listserv and or the Virginia Association for Biological Farmer farmers newsletter um, and Katie will put both of those in the chat right now so that you can sign up. We encourage you to sign up for updates and news. Um, so just a couple of zoom tools before we get started. Um, for the Q&A feature, please type questions for um, the speakers in the Q&A instead of in the chat. Um, if they're in the chat, they might get lost, but in the Q&A, we'll, we'll see them more easily and the speakers can answer them live or they can type their answers directly into the Q&A. And in the chat, please share any comments or any tech support questions that you have. Um, you can put those in the chat and Katie, as I said, will address any tech support issues. Um, and for now, please share your name and where you're tuning in from. And when you do that, be sure to select all panelists and attendees. Um, so that everybody can see where you're joining us from. So without further ado, I will pass it over to Dr. Kim Nawalny, who will introduce our speakers. There we go. Thank you, Garland. Appreciate all of your support and getting us organized this morning, or technically now it's afternoon, so, so welcome. All right, so I have the distinct pleasure to not only introduce um, our, our session today, but really to warmly welcome and introduce our key panelists who have agreed to come with us and organize with us. We have, um, and I, before, we, before I do an introduction for, for each of our speakers, I just want to just want to kind of reemphasize that this particular program and similar ones that we've been offering the last uh, several weeks and probably actually months and, and, and those that we'll be offering again is, is in fact a collaboration. And the Virginia Beginning Farmer Coalition itself is a collaboration of multiple organizations who are working with farmers, uh, new and beginning farmers across Virginia. That includes, of course, the ABF and the VSU Small Farm Outreach Program and through extension. And, but I wanna particularly um, do a little uplift for AgriAbility Virginia today. AgriAbility Virginia is a USDA funded program that supports uh, farmers, farm workers, and farm families who experience injury, illness, and disability. And one of our main goals in AgriAbility is to, in fact, to focus on injury prevention. And we wanna make sure our farmers and our young farmers and our farmers-to-be, as well as our farmers who've been in the field for many years, are, are being taken care of. And that means talking to and working with a variety of network professionals who are both healthcare professionals as well as agricultural safety professionals. And so this particular talk today is in the spirit of, of thinking about who is in your network of safety professionals as well as who is um, 
able to help you as a farmer, as a new farmer, or one in which has been around for a while in the field, to, to really lean into and to support your overall health and well-being. And AgriBilly is just one of those individuals. We have great network, including our um, Department of Aging Rehabilitation Services. Uh, Virginia Farm Bureau Young Farmers has been a great partner with the farm safety programming and, and many, many others. And so I just wanna just emphasize that as well as always recognizing Virginia Cooperative Extension agents and specialists who continue to support this work. So to me, that was important because I wanna make sure you all know that you can lean in well beyond after this program. So let me do an introduction of our speakers today, really excited. Um, three individuals who have been very kind to offer their time with you. And I'm gonna turn my head to this screen to my right so I can actually properly introduce, so that's why I'm looking over here. So first and foremost, I'd like to introduce Dr. Amy Johnson, who's a nurse practitioner with Central Medical Group in Bedford, Virginia. She's a certified AgriSafe provider with her doctorate in nursing practice from Radford University. Her interests include prevention of ag injuries, increasing preventative health care and agriculture, and ensuring mental health of farmers and their families. Um, Dr. Johnson has and continues to serve on the AgriAbility Virginia Advisory Group. And we're very pleased and, and very excited for her participation there. And Amy has been an active member of the agricultural community for, for many, many years. I think those of you who are familiar with her name would know that, but she lends such an expertise to bridging the world, agriculture and healthcare coming together. So that's what the spirit of today is. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Johnson, for joining us. Um, next, I want to introduce Dr. Charlotte Harris, who is a board-certified orthopedic surgeon and grew up on a farm in Floyd County, Virginia, where she sustained her first fracture while driving a tractor. She went on to attend Virginia Tech, Medical College of Virginia in Richmond, and completed orthopedic surgery residency at Medical College, Medical College of Ohio in Toledo. Dr. Harris has been in the field of orthopedics since 1982 and has been working in the same Kentucky farming community for the last 32 years. We are so pleased to have you join us, Dr. Harris. Thank you so much for your contribution to this work. I know you are a supporter of AgriBility as well, so thank you. Um, and next, I'd like to warmly introduce Dr. Hannah Harris, who is an occupational therapist who had worked with AgriBility of Virginia in particular through some current work focusing on mental mental health and awareness with, with um, our agricultural community. She grew up on a small beef cattle farm in Salem, Virginia, where her grandparents taught her about owning and caring for livestock and gardening. She has been a practicing occupational therapist for a little more than 10 years and has enjoyed working in rural settings throughout Southwest Virginia. So we have three fine, excellent agricultural and um, healthcare professionals today talking to you about injury prevention, for farmers. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Johnson to kick us off. So thank you. Thank you, Kim. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you this afternoon and um, to kick off this presentation with these other fine ladies that we're going to be, um, you're going to be hearing from this afternoon. Um, I'm going to be um, doing basically a, a kind of overview of injuries in the farming community. And um, it's gonna kind of barely skim the surface, but hopefully kind of provide an insight to injuries that are common in the farming community and how those injuries happen. So let me go to the next slide, please. Um, the picture of agriculture is, is one of an aging population. Um, the average age of the farmer is between 58 and 59 years old, and you know, they're continuing to get older every day. Um, it's, it's encouraging to see young people wanting to come into the, the um, industry, but the truth of the matter is, is we do have a lot of, of older farmers that are continuing to work in farming. In Virginia, there's more than 36% of the farmers are over 65 years old. And, and continuing to work very hard on their farms. Agriculture itself is one of the third most dangerous jobs in the world. And in any given year, you can, um, there may be over 150,000 disabling injuries in agriculture. Um, the average risk of injury every year is 10 to 40%. And that may be a simple injury such as a sprain or a laceration or a completely debilitating injury. About 5% of all agricultural injuries will result in a permanent injury, 
that will keep that farmer from continuing to farm or require um, um, changes to the way that he farms or adaptations to the way that he farms in order to keep them to continue farming. The one of the big things with the aging population is that chronic health conditions come into play. And along with chronic health conditions, we see things like medications and um, decreasing function of that farmer that increase their risk of injury and really change the outcome of what could have been a simple injury. So as I move forward through this presentation, we'll kind of talk about that and how that changes um, some of the outcomes. And my colleagues will, will touch on that as well. So traumatic injuries happen on the farm in various ways. And these are certainly not the only things that cause traumatic injuries, but these are some of the most common things that we see. Tractors are responsible for 50% of all fatalities and farming injuries. And people can get harmed on tractors in many ways, but the most common are going to be rollovers, runovers, and roadway collisions. And um, Dr. Harris is going to go into that in greater detail. But when ROPS, um, or rollover protection systems, became standard on tractors, it in decreased the risk of injury from 38%, or sorry, it increased the um, survivability of a rollover from 38% to 99%. However, you still have to be able to stay on that tractor, meaning you have to use a seat belt with a rollover protection system. Um, it's kind of like in a car, if you use an airbag, but you don't use your seat belt, um, they work best together. Um, in 2014, only about 62% of tractors were equipped with rollover protection systems. Um, and that's because a lot of tractors are still being used that are older tractors. Um, that are tractors that are 40 to 50 years old. And that was before rollover protection systems were put into um, standard production and were actually standard on tractors. And it's expensive to retrofit these tractors. Um, there have been programs that have looked at retrofitting tractors and, and putting rollover protection systems on them. Um, but those programs are, are few and far between. And it's, it's an expense for a farmer. And lots of times they don't see the benefit in it until after an accident has occurred. Um, in terms of machinery, um, this may mean balers, mowers, um, augers, um, any, any type of equipment that is used on the farm. Agriculture is one of the primary industries that um, you see a large majority of amputations. Um, farmers face a one, in a one in 10 lifetime risk of suffering an amputation on the farm. Upper limbs are actually the most common. About 65% of amputations on a farm are going to affect the upper limb. And these amputations um, can lead to many, many complications because they're not what we consider like guillotine amputations, where they're very clean and straight cut. Um, amputations with farm machinery are or tend to be very grotesque injuries. Um, you know, the tissues are ripped and, and tissues are severed and um, it can be very um, difficult to, to repair these wounds and, and kind of put things back together. Um, PTO shafts are a common cause of amputations and the PTO shaft is the, um, basically the shaft that connects the tractor to the machinery and, and provides power to that piece of equipment. And in the ideal world, that PTO shaft has a shield on it. It's protected. Nobody goes near that PTO shaft when it's running. Um, in reality, if you go onto a farm, you're, you may see PTO shafts with those covers missing. You may see people moving around that PTO shaft that's running. Um, it may take a few seconds to turn that PTO shaft off, but that's something that's typically forgotten. Um, and PTO shafts will run at 540 rotations per minute, or they'll run at 1,080 rotations per minute. But at a slower speed of 540 rotations per minute, that PTO shaft is spinning at nine times per second. If it catches a shoestring, if it catches a string on a hoodie, if it catches long hair that's not secured, a loose shirt tail, before anybody has even the wherewithal and the thought to even react to that, that PTO shaft has gone around basically about 27 to 36 times because it takes an average human about three to four seconds to react to an emergency. And in that time, it's wrapping 
not only that piece of clothing or whatever it's caught, but it's wrapping that person around that PTO shaft. And that's a very common cause of injuries as well as fatal injuries. Livestock are the most common cause of non-fatal injuries on the farm. Um, livestock, we, we tend to think of, you know, how, you know, the cute puddly calves and the lambs and everything this time of year, but livestock, we, we work with them in close quarters. They're large animals. Um, they're very unpredictable. Um, you think of mama cows with calves, um, Holstein bulls that have been handled by humans all their lives and they really don't have a natural fear of humans. Um, you know, when we're working with them in close quarters, um, you know, it's easy for them to um, step on us, kind of push us around, get us up in behind gates. Um, and it, it doesn't take much for them to really kind of overpower us and, and, and get us caught up in a situation. Um, recently, actually, the, the nurse that works for me, her husband was working with some cows and had a steer calf that decided he didn't want to go through the gate and really just head butted the gate. But in the process of doing that, caught the gentleman's hands in the gate and caused a laceration all the way through the gentleman's hand. Um, and required multiple surgeries um, to clean it out and do some repairs and um, caused some pretty significant nerve damage in his hand. And the steer itself never actually came in contact with the patient. He just hit the gate and the gate came back and caught the gentleman's hand. So livestock in, in, as a general rule is, is very unpredictable and we have to watch them very closely. Grain bins um, are responsible not only for injuries, but entrapments. Um, in recent years, we've seen a, a significant number of grain bin injuries in Virginia, unfortunately. Um, it's not something that we necessarily always think about or, or talk about, but grain within a grain bin, particularly with an auger running, is basically kind of the same principle as quicksand. Once an individual is submerged to their knees, it's impossible for them to self-rescue. So they can't get themselves out of that grain at that point. And it's, it's a constant downward force that's pulling them into that grain. A person can be fully submerged in grain in under 20 seconds. And once somebody is fully engulfed within grain, it can take greater than 2000 pounds of pressure to basically pull them back up out of that grain. Um, grain rescues are very specialized and something that we've been working on in Virginia is really training fire and EMS crews on how to respond to these type of injuries and how to um, rescue these people in a safe manner so that we're not having additional um, injuries and additional emergencies in the fire and rescue community trying to save people that get um, submerged in grain. The other thing to think about when it comes to grain, um, particularly in silos or grain bins, is the type of environment that we're working in. Um, because the oxygen limiting silos are gonna have oxygen below what is required for life. So it's the oxygen levels are such that in order to enter that environment, you have to have a self-contained breathing apparatus. You have to be able to provide your own oxygen. So somebody working in that environment or somebody that slips and falls into that environment accidentally um, may be overcome by the lack of oxygen. So you may have a medical emergency on top of the fact that you have a traumatic emergency. Um, and grain, when it's fermenting, particularly in the early stages, produce a lot of gases that can displace oxygen within the human body. So you get suffocation, basically, um, and um, issues within um, the lungs, such as pulmonary edema or swelling within the lungs because of these gases that are caused by the grain fermenting. Um, so you may have medical issues complicating a um, underlying traumatic injury because of the environment that they're in. So you have to think about that if you have somebody that is submerged or entrapped in grain, it may not be the best thing just to run into that environment because you may be putting yourself in danger too. So considering not only the injury, but also the environment that they're in is very important. Next slide. No. Um, we see a lot of slips, trips, and falls um, on the farm. And um, 
I think um, Hannah Harris is going to go into that in, in quite a lot of detail, I think. But, um, you know, there's uneven terrain on farms. Um, there's a lot of wet surfaces. You know, think about around dairies where they're constantly cleaning. Um, heights, climbing grain bins, climbing up on machinery, climbing on tractors. Um, it's easy to lose your footing when you're working, you know, like just this past weekend in the ice trying to get um, cows fed and sheep fed and hay out. Um, and it's, it's very easy to slip and fall and cause a, a broken bone, a broken hip, a broken ankle. Um, and, you know, those are, are very common injuries that we don't necessarily think about being related to farming, but a farmer that suffers a broken bone can have a significant impact on his ability to continue um, and take care of those animals in that farm for a period of time. And then we look at cumulative farming, which is something that's um, not necessarily immediate and acute trauma, but trauma that happens over time, such as vibration from the tractors and the machinery. And that can have a long-term effect on your tendons and your joints and your bones and create things like arthritis and tendonitis, which um, Hannah's gonna go into in a lot more detail in a few minutes. Next slide. Um, eye safety is something that you have to um, consider. You only have one set of eyes um, and on the farm, there's flying debris, there's dust, lots of chemicals, sun damage and light damage, both from the UV light, but also for folks that are welding or using gas torches. Um, and they should always have a pair of safety glasses or sunglasses around, um, welding helmets if they do that type of work on the farm in order to protect their eyes um, because their eyes are very, not forgiving. Um, you know, they don't handle injuries well. Next slide. Um, hearing protection is something else that we don't often think about, but is something that's very easy to do. Um, the majority of farmers have some degree of hearing loss. Um, hearing loss is really related to the intensity of sound and the length of exposure. Um, a lot of people complain of their ears being stopped up or that they hear ringing in their ears. Um, once that damage is, is done to those organs that uh, um, affect the hearing, it's, it's, you really can't undo that. And unfortunately, a lot of the tones that people lose are those that are like women's voices and children's voices. So it's hard for them to hear their grandchildren. It's hard for them to hear their wives talking. Um, but, you know, a lot of things in farming are louder than the acceptable level of 85 decibels, which the CDC has set, um, such as grain dryers. Um, gunshots, squealing pigs, tractors that are idling. I mean, all those are things that create vibration and sound too loud for our ears for an extended period of time. Um, you know, we talked about the ice storm this past weekend. The elements play into um, injuries quite significantly. Um, you know, a, a simple fall may cause a, a very insignificant injury, but a farmer that falls um, outside in ice and cold temperatures that gets wet and the winds blow and the wind chill, they can get hypothermia very, very quickly. And that's gonna compound that injury and make it much more severe than what the initial injury was. So making sure that, that farmers are dressed for the um, weather, that um, you know they are not, um, they know what time they're supposed to be back home. So if they're not, we can go looking for them. So they're not out in the exposed in the cold longer than necessary is very important. Certain medications such as blood thinners, um, blood pressure medications can affect how their body reacts to the cold. Um, same as the heat. Um, you know, it's very easy for patients that are on diuretics or certain diabetic medications for them to get heat exhaustion or heat stroke um, much more quickly than others. Um, of course, we're making hay in the summer, or we're, we're um, harvesting crops in the summer, and we can't really just stop in the middle of the day when it's, when it's the hottest. So we have to be very careful about making sure that we're hydrated and we're not getting too hot and understanding when somebody is starting to show signs of heat illness and getting them the help they need is very important. Um, skin cancer is one of the things that I see most frequently in primary care. Um, Anything that looks abnormal on the skin should be looked at and should be assessed by a um, healthcare provider and may need to be biopsied and removed. Um, the sun causes damage to the skin and then we start to see changes consistent with um, skin cancers. 
And um, you typically see them, I see them a lot on the nose, the tops of the ears, the forehead, the back of the neck, and on the forearms, um, which are common sites where um, they're not, the skin is not covered when they're outside. So prevention is, is key when it comes to preventing injuries, making sure that your equipment is well-maintained. Um, you know, you have slow moving vehicle signs on your equipment, your PTOs are covered, you have your rollover protection um, on your tractors, their tractors have good lighting and good working order, you have fire extinguishers on your machinery. Um, you do safety checks, keep the clutter up in shops, make sure you have a first aid kit. Um, have an emergency plan, know um, the field locations or GPS coordinates of the fields, know the access points and know, make sure that everybody on the field knows where to get into fields and knows where to access them so they can direct um, fire and EMS how to get there. Um, know where your farmer is going to be and what time they're expected back. So if they're not back, they can come. Um, you can go find them and make sure that they're okay and they haven't been injured. Um, and just, these are just some examples, you know, to kind of make you think, um, I, I put the doctor or the Mountain Dew bottle up there for a reason. Don't store chemicals in their improper containers. Um, when I worked in the ER, I had the unfortunate, um, experience of taking care of a, a toddler that swallowed kerosene out of a Mountain Dew bottle, you know, so keep, keep your areas clean, keep your equipment in good working order, watch out for the elements. Um, next slide. And my biggest pet peeve is people who step over PTO shafts. Stepping over a PTO shaft will only save you three seconds. A researcher spent an entire day with a farmer um, and counted how many times he stepped over that PTO shaft. At the end of the day, he asked the farmer how many times he had stepped over it and he, the farmer told him none. In reality, he had stepped over the PTO shaft 10 times and each time he was putting his life on the line. Um, we do things without thinking about it. Um, we just need to stop and think and pay attention to what we're doing and really think about what we're doing while we're doing it versus kind of getting in the habit of just doing the same thing over and over and really pay attention to the task at hand so we don't inadvertently end up in an accident or with an injury that could have been prevented. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Charlotte Harris. Thank you, that was an excellent presentation. Um, I'd like to go through some, some events that have happened in my career and cover a few topics of discussion, including tractor rollover injuries, proper tractor driving on hilly land and on open roads. And also we're gonna talk a little bit about augers and machinery injuries and a little also about cumulative trauma. These are the basic areas, but I'm gonna focus, uh, I think on tractor rollovers. Next slide. As you've already heard, 50% of tractor rollovers end in death. Um, and that statistic is improving, but uh, it's very devastating. So I think it's very important to understand how to drive tractors on a hillside and on a roadway to help prevent injury. Um, the, the ones that do not get killed often are crushed in the pelvis or chest or possibly in the spine and can lead to paralysis. So the proper technique for driving tractors is very important and rollover cages and seat belts can save lives. Uh, knowing and understanding how to drive on hillsides and highways can save lives. So to understand how a tractor rolls over, you need to understand center of gravity. And the center of gravity is basically the center of the rear wheel. And that center of gravity can be moved up or down depending on what is attached to the tractor. So if you have a large weight on the front or the back of the tractor that changes or moves the center of gravity. And if you attach things above the draw bar that raises the center of gravity, or if you have a bucket on the front of the truck uh, or tractor that raises the center of gravity and the higher the center of gravity is, the easier it is to tip over. Now from this slide, um, you see that it takes a few seconds to realize what's happening and then you have to decide what to do. And once that tractor passes 
the tipping point, it's too late. So it's best to use proper techniques to prevent this from happening in the first place. If you have a heavy implement attached to the back of the tractor, you can use a counterweight attached to the front and that helps um, stabilize the tractor because if you have an auger or a post hole digger that's attached and you raise it up, that's raising the center of gravity in the back. So you need to balance for that. Next. When you are on a hill and you feel that the tractor is losing stability, what you need to know is turn downhill. That's all you need to remember, really. Turn downhill. Keep loads and implements and loader buckets close to the ground to lower your center of gravity. If you have a side mount implement, it's on the uphill side and you raise and lower your uh, bucket or your uh, implements to help lower that center of gravity. Next slide. You can see with the bucket up, the center of gravity is raised. Next. And with it down, it's lowered in a more stable position. Next slide. Um, this talks about um, backing up the hill. It's not intuitive, but you want to use lower gears. Uh, if you're going up and down, you want to use the same gear uh, because if you use a high gear going down the, the hill, it can pop out and, and freewheel and get away from you. So you always want to keep the tractor in a low gear, use your throttle for power and uh, back up the hill and drive down the hill. You want to stay away from ditches because ditches can collapse on you and suddenly you're in a side moving position. When you have the side mount, it's uphill. When you're driving, you always drive downhill. Next. Um, driving on roadways also can lead to some very catastrophic injuries. And if you're gonna be in a busy area or, or uh, out of traffic, you wanna uh, also make sure you have escort vehicles, somebody in front or behind you um, to have flashing lights. Yes. Some of the uh, implements that drive on the Kentucky roadways take up one lane and the entire berm, they're so large. So uh, a vehicle in front and back is very important. Also when driving on the roadway, make sure you lock the pedals together because farmers will forget to do that sometimes. When you're in a field, you may wanna break with one wheel and not the other, but when you go on the highway, make sure to lock those together. And if you're towing something um, and you wanna slow down, be careful about uh, downshifting. If the tra trailer or implement is pushing you, you wanna use your throttle uh, to prevent jackknifing. So if you're going up or downhill, use a lower gear uh, and use your throttle, but never push the clutch in, stay off the clutch. Also on a roadway, uh, make sure that you have this triangular sign, that's the law, you want it pointing up. This shows how high, this uh, diagram shows how high it should be from the ground. Next slide. Uh, tractor injuries, rollovers and road collisions frequently end in catastrophic injuries, but so can auger injuries. And these are very similar to the PTO or the power takeoff um, injuries that we see. And they can be minor, they can be cuts, fractures, or they can be loss of entire limbs or death. And how does that happen? Uh, you can get entangled by an exposed intake screw, a drive belt, or a PTO. You can be struck by uncontrolled spinning of a crank. Uh, you can have a broken safety guard, not realize it, uh, and catch a finger or get your pant leg caught and lose a leg. One thing people forget about it with auger injuries is electrocution because some of these augers are very long and when you raise the tractor uh, up, they're very high. And if you have a cab over the tractor, you may not realize that they're overhead wires. So electrocutions can occur for sure. Um, I also wanna talk a little bit about inexperienced young people. And the youth can be very cavalier and 
may have not operated these types of uh, pieces of equipment before, uh, may have not read the manual, but you know they're they're now considering themselves fully grown and want to help, and all farmers need help. So. I would just say that it is very important not to have anyone under the age of 18 operating uh, or working anywhere near an auger. Next slide. And I, I've been asked to give some examples. So one of the worst things that I've seen, uh, I saw as a third or fourth year resident, a uh, 16 year old got life flighted in after slipping and falling in a grain bin. Uh, very much like the one on this example. And the grain bin had almost emptied, but there were there were some remaining corn in the corners and he got down to clean those out and slipped and fell into the auger. So it was a catastrophic injury. Uh, the poor young man eventually lost both of his legs due to this. So it can be very catastrophic. Next slide. Machinery belts and hitches. Understand your equipment, read the manual. If guards and shields are broken, replace them. Don't ever remove them. Don't bypass safety mechanisms. They're there for a reason. They're there because someone else got hurt doing what you're about to do. And farming is risky and they're there for your protection. Don't bypass them. So I talked a little bit about young people. And in my experience, the worst injuries are in the young and the old. And you can spend all day trying to figure out why that is. Um, my belief is that younger people just don't understand how badly things can go wrong and older people may take shortcuts due to fatigue, arthritis, time constraints. You have to make hay when the sun shines. So they're pushing themselves and they take shortcuts. Next. So I wanna talk a little bit about some cumulative soft tissue trauma problems. And I like to talk about the Itis brothers because the Itis brothers have kept me in business for 40 years, tendonitis, bursitis, and arthritis. And itis just means inflammation. And if it's in a tendon, it's tendonitis. Arthros means joint. That means it's in a joint. Um, and tendonitis is usually caused by overuse. And if you rest and take anti-inflammatories, it gets better. Stretching exercises always help. And there are other factors that play into it, but rest and anti-inflammatories and stretching are key. Bursitis can be brought on by a similar situation. It can also develop with age as you develop bone spurs that rub on the bursa. And uh, chronic bursitis can lead to rotator cuff tears. And our next speaker is gonna to touch on that a little bit. Rotator cuff tears are generally either from wear and tear due to the itis brothers or they're due to a traumatic injury. And arthritis, arthritis comes on with age uh, and genetics and repetitive heavy lifting and um, just poor lifting techniques. And farmers lift all the time and many of them have back problems. And the vibratory element is not on my slide, but it's certainly very real. Uh, truck drivers and farmers have a lot of back problems. Uh, heavy weight and smoking make it worse. Uh, it gets worse with age. Next slide. And a little bit about bone trauma. Uh, farmers get whacked all the time. And so I wanted to just talk about stress or incomplete fractures uh, and give a couple examples of that. Jumping on and off the tractor can lead to a stress fracture in the foot. Uh, a blow can lead to a stress fracture in the tibia. And I've got some examples of the tibia and the foot. And I've seen several uh, stress fractures in farmers where they've accidentally been struck in the leg and it hurt and it swelled, but they could walk on it so they didn't come to the doctor. And then two or three weeks later, they jumped off a tractor and it cracked through. And um, so I've, I've seen this in my practice. I, I've got an example of the sledgehammer in the pool. A uh, patient was splitting wood and, and hit his self in the leg with a sledgehammer and it swelled and it hurt, but he didn't come to the doctor. And then about two weeks later, he jumped into a relatively shallow above ground pool and his tibia snapped. So, and, and these, these can happen from tractor hitches, sledgehammers, Tillers, my, my daughter 
was using a tiller for the first time and it got away from her and bit her tibia. And uh, she had to, she had to be careful with that leg. It took about six or eight weeks to quit hurting and for the swelling to go down. Uh, probably at least eight weeks, I'd say. So in all likelihood, she had an incomplete fracture and she babied it. She was careful with it. She didn't jump on it and it healed. Next slide. So in summary, don't rush. Use common sense. Wear your seatbelt, get a roll cage. When you're tired, go sit down and rest, drink water. Never bypass the safety mechanism and always re replace those guards and, and screens that are broken. Thank you. All right. Two wonderful presentations, two tough acts to follow, but I'll do my best. Um, again, it's a pleasure to be here speaking with you all, and you've heard quite a bit of information from the two previous speakers regarding a lot of the acute care injuries and um, some of those more traumatic types of injuries that we see in practice. So again, my name is Hannah Harris and I'm an occupational therapist and I'm gonna cover, um, focus on more of the overuse types of injuries that I've seen in practice. OTs do um, provide rehab services to clients in the hospital setting after they experience things like a spinal cord injury, um, an amputation, head injuries, such as traumatic brain injuries and sometimes even stroke. But in the outpatient type of a setting, we are often dealing with some of the tendon lacerations, tears, some of the itis brothers that Dr. Harris mentioned previously, some of that lower back pain and the arthritis pain and joint changes that can go along with um, the aging process and many of our agricultural types of activities. So the next few slides will give you a little bit more detail about some of these overuse injuries that we see. Again, rotator cuff tears are quite common in the agricultural community from farmers to ranchers to gardeners. Um, the symptoms that people often will notice and because we tend to not have time to really um, pay as much attention to them as we could or should include a dull ache deep in the shoulder. Folks will often um, notice that their arms begin to feel a little bit weaker. So for ladies, if they're working on their hair um, or working gentlemen and ladies working overhead, your shoulder will fatigue um, pretty easily. And you'll often experience some of that pain and that dull deep ache at night. It can impact your sleep as well. These related risk factors, some of the things we do every day out on the farm include that repetitive overhead activity or heavy lifting over a long period of time. Our posture um, significantly impacts that. The shoulder joint is um, pretty complicated and it's got some tight spaces within there. So if our overall posture is not optimal and throws things off in our shoulder, that wear and tear can happen even at a faster pace. So if this problem doesn't go um, or goes unaddressed, it can impact our ability to properly use our tools and perform our regular tasks out on the farm. It also increases the risk for injuries to the neck and to the other joints in the lower arm, the elbow, the wrist, and the fingers. If you think about our arm as a little bit of an extension ladder, if you extend it out horizontally and the portion closest to the wherever we're starting is weakened, then the other parts have to make up for more of the work and there's more strain on those joints as well. And of course, if it impacts our rest, that impacts our safety in other areas, all other areas. Lateral epicondylitis, otherwise known as tennis elbow, um, doesn't only impact athletes that participate in tennis. We see this often in lots of occupations, farming included, the symptoms being a, a painful burning or ache outside of the elbow um, caused by inflammation there as well and overuse. So again, the fatigue and injury to the shoulder. So if you already have a partial rotator cuff tear or some previous injury that increases the strain on the elbow and wrist, and then that could lead to this type of inflammation. Um, repetitive tasks that require forceful gripping. So working on the shop, um, in the shop, working on fence posts, anything that requires hand tools and forceful gripping can increase our risk for this type of an overuse injury and ultimately could lead to the inability to use the arm or the wrist, um, maintaining any kind of desired grasp on your tools or equipment. And again, that ache and that pain can impact your overall quality of sleep. 
carpal tunnel syndrome is another one that we see quite often. And that is um, see, often felt and described as tingling and numbness, sometimes even severe pain and loss of feeling in the, um, in the hand, specifically the index and the middle fingers and often the thumb. That pain can happen at night, but ultimately it's caused by an inflammation of the band there that holds that nerve and, can, and puts pressure on it. So the repetitive or prolonged bending, turning and movement of your wrist or hand. So again, kind of thinking of some of those basic everyday activities that we do, twisting tools, screwdrivers, um, maintaining grasp on a steering wheel, the vibration of a steering wheel can, and the position of our wrist can increase the risk of this type of a, an overuse injury as well. Carrying heavy buckets, um, if you think about how you carry a heavy load, oftentimes to get a better grip, we try to flex or bend the wrist and holding it like that can cause um, more challenges with this diagnosis as well. Uh, oftentimes, again, when we're thinking about what is the impact on our everyday lives is that we won't be able to make a fist. There's a lack of strength in the hand. Again, those manual types of tasks become harder and your sleep is also gonna be impacted again here as well. The hand and wrist tendonitis and bursitis. So Dr. Harris spoke to these already, kind of giving the background. Uh, the most common one that I've seen is something, a funny little word, um, de Quervins, um, and it is impacts the thumb joint as well, which as you know, is a very important aspect of our hand that helps us to maintain our grasp on all things and manipulate objects throughout the day, whether they're small or large. And oftentimes folks will experience pain when moving their hand or their fingers. There could be a small lump or swelling that occurs wherever that bursitis or tendonitis is, is occurring within the wrist and the hand. The causes of these are repeated movement and strain of the wrist. So oftentimes folks who do a lot of time um, gardening, working out in the field with their crops and things like that, that have to get down and do weeding processes or caring for the plants will experience some of these injuries as well. There can be sometimes permanent joint changes if we don't take a preventive approach to this, which could require surgery and um, some long time off or needed long time off or needed adaptations to how we do things. All right, talking about the lower back. So again, um, this is a common challenge, complaint, injury. Um, pain, ache that farmers and ranchers and gardeners will, will share. Um, some of the causes, lifting objects greater than 25 pounds. So if you think about what you're lifting throughout the day, I'm sure there's plenty of things there. Um, repeatedly lifting lighter objects with poorer form or posture can cause that as well. Repetitive twisting when moving objects of any weight. Um, the lighter ones, if you do it more frequently can still cause that. And of course you're at an increased risk if they're heavier objects, whether you're picking up livestock, um, twisting to move them around, those kinds of things. And then awkward postures while working where it's best if we're doing something that requires a long time in a standing position that we have a couple of different solutions for that. So there's different mats you can put down in your shop. We wanna make sure that you're not standing there with your knees locked um, for long periods of time, finding a way to rest one foot up on a stool or on um, a bar perhaps in, in your shop. And again, that driving on farm equipment, we've already talked about the vibration and the impact um, we have sort of built-in shocks in our spine, those discs that happen in between the vertebrae, but like anything else over time, if you're constantly experiencing that vibration, the, um, the discs will actually be um, compressed and could lead to other injuries as well. And then of course we have the traumatic injuries, slips, falls, um, those kinds of things that we've talked about as well. And low back pain, um, can range in the severity of its symptoms. They can, it can be mild, it can be short. You can take an aspirin um, and feel better the next morning. You can do some stretches and it might not last for that long of a period of time. But if we don't take action and modify how we're doing things and those mild and short length of time injuries um, continuously happen over time, they can lead to more um, long-term deficits and even disability uh, resulting in maybe having to, to cease engaging in farming, which we all love to do as well. 
And then the last one, just going to um, piggybacking on what Dr. Harris already shared about the arthritis. Again, this is the swelling and tenderness of one or more of your joints. Um, and Garland, if you can click it one more time, there we go. Um, and the most common symptoms often being pain and stiffness. And I have circled here on these gentlemen, the primary areas where we do see arthritis in the neck, the shoulder, the, the hip, the low back, the thumb, fingers, knees, and um, the toes actually. So obviously those are very important with all the work that we do and our everyday lives as well. And there are some risk factors that we can control. We can control our weight. Um, we can control how we manage any other type of an infection. Those joint injuries from overuse can also contribute to um, arthritis progressing a little bit faster, depending on what type. And then occupations that involve repetitive bending, squatting, and twisting. I'm sure if you all think about family members and loved ones who have been in the agriculture industry for a long time, you probably heard about hip replacements, knee replacements. Um, some even are replacing the main joint in the thumb um, at times or having to have other types of orthopedic surgeries. And then smoking is another one that we could um, control. So smoking cessation is a, a good idea as well. So the take home points here, um, being that treatment and recovery from these overuse injuries, regardless of if they require um, someone like Dr. Harris's surgical intervention or other means or conservative management where you might come to see a therapist such as myself and we don't have to do anything invasive, it can take months of time to recover and get back to our um, pre-existing level of function, regardless of where the injury is. And if you have an injury in one place, like I shared with, with the shoulder, um, it increases your risk of injury to other parts of the body as well, which could be even more debilitating. And then untreated injuries can turn into long-term problems. But the good news is that with planning and prevention and problem solving, um, which I believe farmers are natural problem solvers, um, on a daily basis, we can prevent some of these things. And I think it's vitally important if you are an older farmer that you take these things seriously because if you have grandchildren or um, children even, or just friends of the family, anybody that's gonna be taking over or participating in your business, if you can help them to reduce their risk of injury, then they can be farmers and participate in this activity for a much longer period of time with reduced pain. Next slide. All right, a couple of um, now some solutions, strategies and techniques to reduce these types of injuries. We've got um, first and foremost, we have to identify the high risk activities. So those activities that have a lot of lifting, bending, twisting, um, repetitive use and motion, those activities are the ones that you should be thinking about in your head. We have to identify those and then figure out ways that we can implement what we call ergonomic principles, um, which reduce the risk of the injury and actually um, create some nice um, preventative measures. So we can modify or change what you're doing or the work environment itself. There are a commercially available adaptive and ergonomic tools that are out there. There are also customizable needs sometimes based on the farmer themselves, and there are resources for that. Use proper lifting techniques. And then we touched a little bit about um, completing stretching routines as prescribed or recommended by a healthcare professional. And actually on AgriAbility's Facebook website, I saw they've got a great video for some yoga stretches that can be implemented, especially designed for farmers and ranchers as well. So talking about lifting um, and moving heavy equipment, this slide shows an image of kind of the power zone and the danger zone. So again, if you think about reaching, extending your arm out at full length, and if you were to try to pick up a jug of milk, eight pounds with it fully extended, the amount of effort that it would take from all of your joints in your upper extremity would be quite significant versus if you had the, the jug of milk within 12 to 17 inches of your body. So at that point, your um, elbow would be nicely tucked in deep next to your torso. And you pick that up, it's a little bit less strain, a lot less strain on the joints um, and a lot of reduced risk of injury to those tendons and ligaments of those different joints. Um, again, looking at using safely ladders and lifts for tasks that may require overhead work, um, reducing the um, length of time that you're reaching overhead is very important. If you're in workspaces that it's possible to do so, thinking of workshops, 
um, potentially where we have livestock coming in for vaccinations and things like that, making sure that you have work surfaces that are elbow height and they allow space for forearms to rest on top of them so that you are fully supported um, while you're working in those, whether it's sitting or standing. If you're in an environment where you are frequently, or even if you're doing a job for a day or several hours that you're going to be in the same spot for that time period, set that workspace up so that tools and frequently used items are between your knee and your shoulder height, and that they're again within 17 inches of your body. And then making sure that you build in rest breaks approximately every 20 minutes if you're going to be doing something continuous. So if you're out in a field and you're working um, with crops and you're doing weeding types of activities or harvesting, making sure that you take frequent rest breaks. They don't have to be very long, uh, but they, they are important to give your body a stretch and a rest. Looking at some of the long handled tools, these are just a few examples. There are a lot of things that are, um, again, commercially available these days. So if you're transporting plants, trees, other types of crop materials, rather than repetitively bending down and picking up the, the containers, there are several different options for long handles that would reduce that, again, bending and stooping. The middle picture is an ergonomic handle for a shovel, but you can use it for any tool that has a long handle. Some of these, again, are coming pre-made like this. There are some attachments that you can make, but you see that gentleman is standing nice and straight and tall while he's got his hands um, placed on the tool. Whereas if the extended handle there, which looks like it's his right hand, wasn't there and he had to, he would be in a stooped position, his trunk would be flexed for that period of time. And he would also be doing a little bit more twisting. And then the same is true for that push broom there, the picture on the right. When moving those heavier, more awkward types of loads, which there are things that um, are just awkward and heavy, uh, make sure that we use containers with handles. Sometimes if we're harvesting crops, you should try to use uniform types of containers that have handles on them using a dolly versus um, you know, more isn't necessarily always better. So instead of the huge containers, figuring out one that's nice and compact so that you would be able to keep it close to your body for proper lifting. Um, so redesigning the load and then using dollies or pallet trucks or roller conveyors um, as indicated by the user manual, making sure that all things are up to speed and safe and transporting those loads if they're going more than a few feet or if they're repetitive. So how do we do proper lifting? Hopefully this is something that you have heard a little bit before, um, but making sure that you move you're close to your work area or whatever it is that you're going to be lifting so that you reduce the need to lean or bend forward. Um, I know on our own farm, I can't uh, think of how many times when we're loading and unloading hay that we're bending, we're just in such a hurry when we wanna get it done, bending over the hay wagon and pulling the, the bale closer to us when instead of just waiting on whoever is there on the wagon to push the bale towards us so that then we have a nice um, lifting space coming from us. Make sure that we're lifting um, between or just above, again, the knee level and the shoulder level when possible and keep the load close to your body and lift with your legs instead of your back. So making sure that you're bending your knees and your hips instead of bending forward with your back. It's a couple of different options as well. So there was the picture from the previous slide with the gentleman having both of his feet um, next to one another with shoulder width apart. Another option would be to um, step one foot slightly back and kind of take that diagonal lift. And then making sure that when we're moving an object from one place to the next, even if it's not, uh, if it's not forward, if it requires a turn, that we're turning our feet instead of twisting our back. It doesn't take that much longer period of time. Um, you're not gonna lose that much time that way and making sure that you vary things um, as you can. So maybe every 10 bales doing the diagonal lift and then every 10 more do the, the squat technique. Looking at field hours, um, again, we've talked about the vibration. So most newer tractors and equipment are gonna come ergonomically designed tractor seats. 
that have that suspension element to them. They're not perfect, but they are getting better. They do have lower back support as well. Um, so if, but if your tractor doesn't come with one, there are often you can purchase them and, and attach them to your tractor or your equipment at this time. Making sure you use proper mounts and dismounts and techniques. So repetitively jumping from a surface. Um, and I know we do that from a very young age, speaking for myself as well, can put you at an increased risk, not only for slips, trips, and falls, but also again, for that repetitive kind of compression of your spine um, and also potential injuries to your ankles and your knees. So there are mounts that you can mount to your tractor that will help. There should be non-slip types of surfaces as well. And you should always maintain three points of contact to wherever you're stepping down from. So whether it's two hands and one foot, um, that helps as well. That way you're making sure that you're not jumping, reducing that risk. Make sure you have wide angle mirrors and potentially swivel seats to avoid twisting of the spine, especially when you're out in the field for several hours. Um, hand tools, so regardless of if this is for construction, maintenance of equipment, um, gardening types of tasks, these rules would still apply and be very helpful in reducing the elbow and wrist injuries that I talked about previously. So making sure that the handle size of single handle tools um, allow for about a three eighths of an inch overlap as pictured here of the thumb and the forefinger. You can increase that diameter of your tool with some basic things that are commercially available. There's lots of tapes out there. There are products like the one pictured here that can add to the grip to any handle, but please do note that for smaller hands, sometimes that's the difference between female and male individuals, um, or maybe you just have smaller or larger hands, um, the recommended range is a little bit different. And make sure that when you're covering the handles that you have non or slip resistant materials such as plastic or rubber. Then you have dual handle tools such as our um, trimmers, pliers, those types of things. They should be at least four inches in length. Um, they should have a spring return to maintain that open position so you're not having to do that as well. And they should be straight without finger grooves. A little bit of a warning, um, companies that produce tools are getting smarter and recognize that ergonomics is important. But when you read the advertisements for them, make sure that the tool actually represents some of these ergonomic principles because they'll throw the word ergonomic in there and their marketing strategies and it's not really um, accurate. Um, a couple of uh, different examples of using tools that promote straight or neutral position of the wrist. So remember that um, that inflammation of the wrist that I mentioned earlier comes when we have repetitive bending of the wrist. So making sure that we look for and or create opportunities to maintain that neutral position. So the image on the left is actually a blueberry rake and demonstrates kind of the no movement that uh, most of us just naturally do. And then having to work towards that yes movement of moving the shoulder more than the wrist. And then there's a couple of different examples also of gardening tools that have been adapted for um, neutral position. All right, a couple of examples. And so this first one we can see on the left, the woman is in a long um, stooped position and she's often gonna be bending more frequently, which we don't want to, we want to avoid that. So the improvement here would be that we bought a simple rolling cart and she can move the flats to the top of it. See some of the principles I talked about previously where that woman has her right leg resting on the lower portion of the locked rolling cart. And she's able to work at a surface that is about elbow height for a long period of time, which would reduce the risk of injuries to her back and her shoulders and her wrists. And then the second one, um, this picture is a little hard to see, but on the left, the, the woman is actually trimming um, different types of crops that have really dense stems. So that repetitive use of um, clippers and snips and things like that. So she could get those spring loaded ones, but the solution that actually came about here would be that they got a power trimmer that she could simply um, place the, the plant there and it would do the work for her. All right, and that's it. Thank you.
So hi again, everyone. I recognize that we're over time, but we we can take a couple of questions if anybody has them. You're welcome to type them into the Q and A feature um, at the bottom of your screen. It looks like I'm just catching up now. It looks like a couple questions have already been asked and answered. Um, so uh, if you have another, just type it in there. Give people just a minute to type in questions if they have any. There's one about whether the recording will be available online somewhere. Yes, it will be. Um, we'll, we did record it and we'll post it to the Virginia Beginning Farmer and Rancher Coalition listserv, as well as the Virginia Association for Biological Farming newsletter. And it will be available on our websites, uh, both the Virginia Association for, or sorry, for Biological Farming uh, website and also the Virginia Beginning Farmer and Rancher Coalition website. I think I just saw a question come through. I was going to answer the question about the backup cameras. Yeah. Um, so I I do like um, the use of, of backup cameras and um, the judicious use of mirrors. Um, my husband actually has a a back issue because of twisting around in the in the tractor seat and. Um, while twisting around in the tractor seat, hitting a um, just a washout in a ditch, um, which caused a um, a herniated disc that he continues to suffer with, and and he's not that old, so anything that can um, aid in the mobility of the tractor while keeping the uh, farmer centered and keeping that spine aligned and avoiding twisting um, is definitely preferred. Um, it doesn't take much. Anytime that spine is out of alignment um, and, and either of the Dr. Harris's may comment more on this, anytime that spine is out of alignment, it affects all the tissues that are around that spine and any little bump or um, amount of trauma can actually do more damage easier than if that spine is aligned and all those tissues are in alignment. So anything um, such as backup cameras, um, extra mirrors in the cab, um, spotters that can allow that farmer to sit more correctly and more posturally aligned within that tractor seat and um, allow them to do the work that they need to do is definitely preferred over um, having them twisting and turning and contorting themselves to try to see what they're doing. Thanks. I completely agree. Answering that. Yeah, let's hear from Charlotte. What were you going to say, Dr. Harris? Well, no, I completely agree. When when the spine is twisted, the uh, disc is eccentrically, and it makes it herniate. So backup cameras and mirrors are the way to go. Great. So it sounds like we have some consensus on that. Thanks so much for answering that question, both of you. Um, I don't see any more questions coming in the Q&A and I do recognize we are over time and I wanna be mindful of our speaker's time as well as our participants' time. Um, so I do have a couple of closing slides to share um, if everybody's okay with moving forward. Um, so we have a couple of upcoming events. Uh, we ha have on February 18th, Feeding the Soil with Pam Dolling. Um, on February 22nd, we have a Yoga for Farmers webinar, um, also a partnership between uh, Virginia Association for Biological Farming and the Virginia uh, Beginning Farmer and Rancher Coalition and Agribility. And then on March 3rd, there's a webinar on building soil health to sustain Virginia's farms and protect water quality and organic approach. And uh, this presentation was co-sponsored by the Virginia Association for Biological Farming. Um, but the VABF relies on our donations to keep going and um, there's a suggestion donation of five to ten dollars if you feel called to donate. Um, you can also become a member or sign up for their newsletter and I think those links are going to be put in the chat if they haven't been already. Oh yeah, there you go. Um, so they're in the chat now. Um, and then also just please fill out our uh, webinar evaluation 
link or sorry, our webinar evaluation to let us know what you thought of this webinar. We'd love to hear your feedback. And that's that link is in the chat now as well. So thank you so much. And thanks so much to all of our speakers. That was really informative. It we, looks like a lot of folks said um, that the presentation was really valuable to them. So I really appreciate all.